Man, praise God, praise God, praise God. Um, we are um, going to continue in this, and um, I think um, the block of scriptures that we're going to cover today, I think, is uh, very encouraging to me, um, really because um, of what we're going to call, talk about, this concept free and two. Um, you go to the Bible, when it's dealing with the gospel, we always talk about where we're being free from and where we're getting free to, right? And, and many times, people are being delivered, but they don't know where they're going. And um, today, Paul does a great job, and uh, he got the verses that we're going to cover. Um, uh, I thank Robbie for helping me out here. Uh, I just revamped the verse selection and the, and the, and the cutout. Uh, but we're going to start in Romans 5. Um, and um, we're going to go all the way to Romans 18. And um, I like think it's going gonna, it's, it's to bless your heart to understand what is the gospel, what is God actually doing, and, and exactly what are we being invited to be a part of, right? So let us pray. Then after that, we're going to jump right into this. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you, God. Thank you for encouraging us in the season. Thank you for giving us a hope that we sometimes don't understand. And it's okay. Because God is something that's greater that's not just on this earth, but God, that you're calling us to something greater. And so God, I ask you to pray right now, God, that you um, quiet down all the distractions. God, we want to see you. We want to know you. We want to fall in love with you. Because if your love is as amazing as scripture says, we want that. God, I ask you to pray, God, that you, um, that someone might hear this this word and and really commit to Christ. Really just fall in love with you and live for you and for you all along. God, I ask you, pray, God, that you open up our eyes so we might see scripture as plainly and clearly as you have written it. God, God, I ask you, pray, God, that you decrease Justin. That God, that they don't see me nor hear me. All they hear is feel your love. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, and so, and so last week, we actually talked about how grace abound, right? And, and exactly what Paul is saying is that no matter how much you sin in your life, there's more than enough grace to cover that. And, uh, and, and uh, where we left off is that he, he ended with this thought of, uh, in Romans 6 when it first starts off, that he says, then if, if there's so much grace and we can never out the love of God, should we just continue in sin? And, he's, and he then makes this statement by no means because he started talking about you are dead to sin. And what Paul is going to do this week is that he's going to finish with that thought about us being dead to sin. And we talked about the, the veil being ripped and God taking the mask off so that we could be in a relationship with him more closely and be intimate with him. And he starts that, that same concept out in verse 5. He says, for if we have been united, with him in death, like he is. And um, this is the beauty of scripture is that there are two great sacraments, um, it, it really three, is it's four, <laughs> three. Uh, so um, that the church get to administrate. Um, he go, the first sacrament is the, the sacrament of marriage. He go, the, he go, the second is the sacrament of communion, and the third at the sacrament of baptism. And the, and the reason why all three of them are what we call the great sacraments is that they all represent unity. Baptism represents unity in, with Christ. Marriage represents unity with two people coming together. And the sacraments of communion represent the unity of the church. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's in this concept that what he's saying is that when you are baptized, you are unified with Christ. You're married. Believe it or not, you're married. It's just as holy as a marriage. And um, um, this is not in my notes, but I share this to you. But did you ever ask yourself, why do people get married and they come to the altar? The reason why they come to the altar is because things die at the altar. And resurrection take place at the altar. And, and many times people want to be themselves and still be in relationship. 
And what, and what Paul is, is, is painting his picture is that if you are to be unified with Christ, you must die. You must die. And that's a hard truth because I'm going to let you know, no one's going to shout on that. You must die like his. He said we certainly will be united with him in his resurrection like his. And this is the beautiful part is that if there is no death, there is no resurrection. So what are you saying, Justin? Are we to die physically? Like, like what are we talking here? And, he, and I think Paul is going to clarify this. He says in the verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we no longer be enslaved to sin. And, and, and this is beautiful because he goes to question that no one in here will raise their hand and say, I'm a slave to sin. Everyone think, I'm free. I'm just doing what I want to do. <laughs> no longer a slave to sin. But, but it, you know what I'm saying? No one would say, I'm a slave to sin. And what Paul is, is doing, and I, and I think this is beautiful, is that what he's saying is that you don't know, but you're being controlled by something that is not you. This is why, <laughs> if we want to get to it, that you can do something, and you think it was great, but after a while, you feel bad about yourself. This is why when you're not living for Christ, you're always met with this concept of depression or worthlessness. Because I'm, I'm, this is such a great passage. Because what the gospel says is that God don't want you living like that. He don't want you feeling like, man, I just got the, I can't help this. You're thinking that you're living out the desires of your heart, but you're really being controlled by this thing called sin. And the, and the, and the crazy part about it is that sin doesn't look all dark, evil, and gloomy. Sin looks like what you think look good. And if Christ does not come in your life to show you what is truly good and what is God, you will always choose what you think is good and you'll always be enslaved for sin. So, so what he says is that your old self must be crucified. And, 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 and the reason why this touches my heart, when I read verse 6, every time it touches my heart and, 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 and frame my theology in a totally different way, is that what he did not say is that your old self was dead with him. He said crucified. Crucified is the process of being killed. That's the process, right? This is why when you wake up, it feels like when you tell yourself no that you're losing. When you submit to yourself and you feel like, God, it's just not fair, you're being crucified. Why? Because there's glory in the resurrection when you're crucified. And the, and, the, and the beauty of it is that God is killing you from something so that he can set you free to something. He says this in verse 7. He says, for one who has died have been set free from sin. Are you still struggling with sin? Maybe because you're not dead yet. See, you see the amazing part about how we do our Christian some days is this, is that we sometimes compartmentalize our lives in a way that I die to this, but this part of my life is still living. And like, and like this is why Christ says, I need all of you. All your heart. I don't, I, I don't want you on Sundays. I want you every day. I like want you when you wake up early in the morning with your breath stinking. I want you right then and there. 
I don't want you to wake up and go put some makeup on and come and pray with me. I, I want you in your rawness. I want every aspect of your life simply because that's how God works. And, and the crazy part is that you can do it and not even know you're doing it. There, there are so many times where we say, man, I believe in God, but God don't really care about this area in my life. Or God don't know anything about this area in my life. And we go to proceed as this area is separated from God. And the beauty of you saying is that you have to die everywhere. Every aspect of your life needs to be turned over to God. Every single aspect of your life. And I, and I, and I, and I say this from a place where going on 10 years, um, I married Michelle, that I actually started working and I, I was a programmer and I was working one day and I was working on a problem and I, and I didn't get it and, and the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, did you pray about it? And I was like, God, don't, why would I pray about coding? Why would I pray about programming? You know what I'm saying? What do God care about coding and programming? And I was convicted and idealist that I literally was separating my life from the newness of life that he was forming in me. Do you know what you call a half <laughs> a dead and a half life person? A zombie. A zombie. A zombie. Right? And you and you and you always see that they paint them, they uh walking around, right? And, and believe it or not, we got Christians like that. They're mindless, trying to live in two worlds, and they're always torn. You have to die to sin. You have to be set free. One of the lipless tests is this. How often do you sin? How often do you sin? That's the first question you should ask yourself. How often do I sin? Right? And, 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 I, and I say this because this is a very relative question. Because everyone in here has big sins, and everyone in here has small sins. Sins and sin. Right? How often do you sin? Because if you're sinning frequently, big or small, Have you died to be free from sin? Right? This is beautiful. Verse 8, he said, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. This is beautiful. Because what Paul does now, he says, he says this, If you have not died to sin, you can't live with Christ. Got that theological understanding? Right? So if you're not dead to sin... You can't live for Christ. And what's the beautiful thing that how, how the enemy has tricked so many Christians is that he got them alive in sin but coming to church every Sunday. He got them <laughs> alive in sin but doing Christian-like things. And they feel like they have a relationship with Christ but they have not died to sin. This is why in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus um, is, is talking to some Christians, and they say, Lord, we've been doing these Christ-like things in your name. He said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That, that Greek word for iniquity is the same word for our sin. Depart from me, I know you're not. And, 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 and this is just one of the things that take place is that you have to die to sin in order for you to live for Christ. Right? Um, verse 9. I'm going I'm I'm to uh, hit this in a second. He says this. We know that Christ being raised from the dead, we will never die again. Death no longer have dominion over him. Verse 10. For death, he died and he died to sin 
once and for all. But the life he lived, he lived to God. He died from sin to live to God. That's the goal. It's for me to say, I'm dead to sin so that I can live for God. See, you see, many times people think grace is for you to keep sinning. That's not why God gives you grace. God gives you grace so you can live to God. Because he knows in your humanity you're going to mess up. You're going to trip. You're going to fumble. But in your fumbling, he frees us so we can get back up and pursue God. Not for us to get back up so that we can fall again. I know what Daniel McCurkley's song said. <laughs> if we get up, we fall down. That, 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 that's not the rhythm of what God's heart is for us. It's not for you to keep falling over the same sin. Because it has something more to do with the heart than you living for Christ. He said this in verse 11. So, you must also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12, he said, let not therefore let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Those feelings that you feel, sin. That release that you feel, sin. Those emotions that you feel, Sometimes it's powered by sin. And you don't even know it. Because you're like, man, I'm so used to just living my life like this. Passionate. <laughs> I'm passionate about how I do things. I'm passionate about what I do. And I actually shared this, that when I was young, um, um, I was watching The Passion of Christ, right? And I, I always had one question. Why do they call it The Passion of Christ? That's not romantic. See, you see, what Satan has done with literature, that he has romanticized the word passion. We actually think passion is this intimate, heated love. But the passion is really the extent that you're willing to sacrifice for what you see value in. Do you know that you sacrifice, man, so much for what you think you get today? I remember, I remember when I was, um, in college, and uh, you know, and people used to joke about me. I used to say this, and that, and that they say, Justin, are you out here uh, getting something? I go, nah, you know, I'm not about to have sex for five minutes and have eternity in hell. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? And like everybody used to joke, they'd be like, oh, Justin, little goody two shoes. But it was just like, do you understand? <laughs> you want a quick release. But you are jeopardizing eternity. Do you know how crazy that is? Man, let me tell you how passion could get you in trouble. Right? Um, there, was a, there was two boys, Jacob and he had a brother named Esau. Jacob was, um, I would say, not as manly man as Esau. Esau had the muscles, he had the beard, he had the, he just looked at it like he was the man. And Esau, Jacob was more like his mom. He stayed in the house, he helped clean. You know what I'm saying? And I, I, I actually love this because one day, 
Jacob and his mom says, you really deserve this, the blessing. Right? And, and, um, and uh, Jacob goes to his brother Esau, and he plays on his passion. He comes in from work. He's hungry. And he don't know how to cook. But Jacob know how to cook. Jacob brings him a bowl of soup, and he says, will you give me your future for this bowl of soup? Would you do that? Would you make that a change? Your whole future for a bowl of soup. The blessing of your father and your inheritance for a bowl of soup. Esau says, let's child. And he gave him his birth inheritance for a bowl of soup. And everyone says, Justin, that's ridiculous. That is written for our benefit because God is showing us how ridiculous we are when we choose sin over the freedom of life. God, you know, I was just, you know, I was just, you know, I had, I had to get it now. You choose for the now and you lose the eternity. Let's take even back further, right? Adam and Eve is in perfection. And the Satans, it, it, and they look at the fruit. And guess what they looked at the fruit? The fruit looked it good. She said it was good to eat and nurture into my body. And, then, 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 and they chose to experiment the now and lost the future. We're talking about sin. Sin never comes in and look evil. Sin says this. Listen here. I'm going to give you what sin says. It says, you can get it now and fix it later. <laughs> what that sound like? Credit. <laughs> Bad now, pay later. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can live in the pleasure now and pump the one and punt the responsibilities down the line. Why worry about that? Let's just live for the now. And if you don't have your passions under control, it's tempting. Do you know why scammers scam people? For two reasons. First of all, they're horrible people. The second reason is that they play on people fear and sin. They call you up and say, hey, I can help you turn $5 to $5,000. <laughs> what? I don't got to work. I don't have to sacrifice anything. This is the, the best situation. And they do it, and you get that $5,000, and you wake up the next morning, and you'll count $100,000 negative, right? This is how they get people. Because their own desires, their own lusts draw them. Listen to this. The devil isn't tempting you with nothing that's not inside of you. I got to give y'all this revelation. Like, so, and so, and so, and so, check this out, right? If the devil brings cigarettes around me, because that's not inside of me, I don't want it. I'm not tempted. But someone else who, who desire that, that's tempting. Right? And so what the enemy does is that he's constantly trying to figure out what makes you turn your head. What makes you pause? See, he, he showed a, he got a story of Adam and Eve, what, is, what it says and in in in, in what we understand is that the reason why Satan was able to tempt Eve, yeah, remember, this is the garden. It's massive. 
is because every day she was walking past it and looking at it. Every day, I wonder why I can't touch that. <laughs> you got so much stuff to do. You can ride a giraffe. I always dream to ride a giraffe on the back. You can ride on whales and dolphins. But every day, why are you walking past the thing that you should not be looking at? Man, listen here, right? Single people, there's some things that you shouldn't even be looking at. Man, there was a season in my life, and, 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 and my friend Brandon would laugh, and he'd say, there he is, that we'll be watching the movie and the scene come over, and I'd cover my eyes. <laughs> I was in college. Why? Because if I see it, it's going to arouse interest. This is why scripture tells us, guard your eyes and your ears. Like, <laughs> I, I like to share with you guys that when I was in high school, I struggled with like lustful thoughts and I never understood where did it come from? It was where I was watching, but it was definitely what I was listening to. All them R&B love songs. <laughs> Next, butter love. <laughs> You got that good, good loving? <laughs> I'm bopping to the beat. But it's arousing something in my soul. And I'm saying, I'm fine. It's not affecting me. But when I got home at home alone, I was like, why do I feel so lonely? Why do I feel like I have like, um, you go to that cartoon, I have so much love <laughs> that I just want to give. <laughs> Where did that come from? I've been meditating on it day and night. This is why when we live for God, we should meditate on God day and night. Read his word day and night. There are some things that don't even tempt me. They used to tempt me. Because of where I put my focus on, right? I have different passions now, right? I'm not just arguing, right? Like, you know, the brothers there tell you, I'm passionate about the word of God and the accuracy of the interpretation of it. I'm passionate. Why? Because that's where my love resides. It's in the trueness of who he is. You know what I'm saying? You could call my phone with some foolishness. I probably won't argue with you. I'll probably be like, okay, hang up, clink. Call me with some theological stuff. You know, <laughs> Michelle had to get me off of Facebook because of this. <laughs> she was like, just to get off the internet arguing with people, I have to feel like, I'm writing books. <laughs> <laughs> Putting references and, and Bible verse, like, like, I'm writing books online, why? <laughs> Passions. And listen here, listen here. And that was dangerous. Why? He got me arguing when I should be proclaiming. See, this is why your passion must always be aligned with God and his glory. And never about what you're feeling. Because you can be passionate about what is, look good, but it's totally distracting you from what you're supposed to be doing. Right? And, um, and I'm, 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 I'm going I'm to share this with you, right? When I was getting ready to pursue ministry, I had, I had a couple elders, and I was talking to them, you know, and they had um, kids and stuff, and they were mentoring me at DePaul. And, um, and I, I like remember one of them, he says, keep first things first, Justin. And I, I'm always going to remember this conversation, and, and I always quote it. Like, if you ever hear me quote, and I'll talk about the, the qualification of the elders, there was one qualification that they drilled in my head to the point. He said, in order to be an elder, he must manage his household well. Not good, well. 
So what could happen? What's the danger behind what he, Paul is saying, right? Sometimes elders are so busy managing other stuff that the house is falling apart. But I'm out here doing the Lord work. But your household is falling apart. But I'm preaching the gospel. Your household is falling apart. Your marriage is falling apart apart. Do you understand the danger of that? I'm so busy trying to proclaim Christ that in the marriage relationship where I'm supposed to be exemplifying Christ, I'm lacking. Distracted because of passions. Do you guys hear what I'm saying here? The dangers of you're not saying, God, where's your heart? Where's your... Listen to this. Listen to this. As believers, we should live on the heartbeat of God. What's the rhythm? How's his heart beating in this moment? Right? You have to die so that you can hear. He says this in verse 13. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been bought from death to life and your members to God as instruments to righteousness. This is the, the this verse is beautiful because what Paul says is that what he, he's talking about, this word instrument can also be interpreted as tools. And um, what he's talking about is this ideal is that do not use your body as a tool for things that is not godly. Right? Do not use your thinking as a tool for things that are not godly. Do, do not use your speech as a tool for things that are unrighteous. But present yourself to God in a way that you live like you used to be dead, but now you live for him. That's the challenge, and that's where his heart is, is that he wants you to live for him so that you might be able to champion righteousness in a world that is broken and dark. Verse 14 says this. He says, for sin will have no dominion over you. I don't know about you, but that is encouraging to me. He said, if you do this, sin won't be able to control you no more. Why? Since you are under, you are not under the law, but under grace. This is what I hinted to you. Grace free you up that I don't got to listen to sin no more. I don't got to listen to sin no more. When, 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 when someone yells at me and say, you... What are you, some type of idiot? I literally laugh sometimes. Because the, the, the thing that used to trigger me doesn't trigger me no more. I'm free. I'm free. When, like, people say, now you know they land people off and everyone nervous. I laugh. Because I'm free. I'm not under things that triggers my emotions. I'm saying, are there things that still trigger me? Yes, and God is working on me. He's working on me. Because sometimes I'll be like, I'm free from that. Then the next day I get a call, and I'll be like, oh, I'm hurt and I'm mad. He'll be like, see, you still need to work. Right? But what he's saying is that the more I free you up from your body, your passions, those sins, that anger, that negative speech that you always down yourself. I'm, 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 I'm talking to the one that sits there and out of nowhere they just say, man, this sucks. Where did that come from? 
Why are you feeling like that? You know God is saying, I want to free you up that you're not always beating up on yourself. You know what I'm saying? I had to learn to start looking at myself and say, I am wonderfully and fearfully made. I used to always say, why are you so fat, Justin? I'm beating up on myself with words, not looking at myself as Christ looked at me, but looking at me Amen. as the sin in my heart is looking at me. You know what I'm saying? I like, I like used to mess up something. You know, I've been trying to solve a problem and I mess up or I forget something. You'd be like, Justin, you're so stupid. That's sin talking. That ain't God. Right? I no longer needs to be controlled to say that. that. Why would I ever talk bad about yourself if you love yourself? But sometimes you being controlled like a puppet. Do you know how Satan knows he's controlling you like a puppet? You can be super happy. Skipping. And like God, and the enemy say, watch me mess it up. Like 90 th 99 things is going right in your life. And he say, mess it up. And now you depress and your world is crashing in. He's saying, I'm controlling them like a puppet. But grace frees you up that when he do that, you say, Although I lost one, I got 99. Man, I'm going to tell you how amazing grace is. Grace gets you to a place that you say, although I lost 99, I still got one. Amen. Right? Grace frees you up that you can say what Paul says in Philippians. I have learned to be content in whatever state that I'm in. Right? Because as long as I'm pursuing God, it's all right. It's all good. He says in the verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. And he's finishing up his argument of, listen, listen. There's some preachers that preach grace like grease. And it's not grease. It is not for you to slip in, do what I want to do, come up here and say, Lord, save me. Then after you get done, you say, God, I'm going to go do that real quick because I could go back and he's going to accept me. That's a heart issue. That's a heart issue. You know what I'm saying? Listen, listen. Do you know growing up in the church how the enemy has affected my thinking of grace? And teaching about asking for forgiveness. I used to think like this. I can go sin and then repent. Because I'm good. Until someone has to say, he's not going to forgive you. Why? Because you're doing the sin isn't the issue that you need to repent for. It's your mentality of how you approach that sin. And that's the problem that sometimes we, we think God is so worried about what I did. Oh, God, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I like messed up. Yeah, I did this. Or yeah, I ended up sleeping with this person or doing, 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 doing all this stuff. And you feel like he's so worried about that, but he's so worried about what in your heart led you to think that was okay. What in your heart? After everything I have done for you in this world, why did you think that was okay? He says this, by no means. You should not be sinning if you're under grace and you're living in grace. And, that, and this concept of sinning, not if you mess up once in a blue moon. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people who practice sin. There's people who practice sin, you know, you know, they always picking up their phone, calling those numbers, 
always gospering, always blowing up, right? We're looking at patterns in your life, a.k.a. rhythms, to see, does it match the heartbeat of God? Does it match the heartbeat of God? He says in the verse 16, and we're we almost done. He says this. Do you know that if you present yourself to, to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? It's either sin, which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness. What are you a slave to? And this is critical here. Listen, listen, listen here. This is probably the most critical question I'm gonna ask in this series. What are you a slave to? Because you can be a slave to something that's close enough but it's not obedience and you're still a slave to sin. And like that's how the devil started planning your mind. Is that he says, how close can I get them to being as close to godliness as possible but deny the power thereof? So guess what? I believe God in everything, but I'm still out here thinking I got to do it myself. I'm out here singing these amazing songs. The Lord never fails, but I'm upset that I got rejected. He got you so close that you're not completely obedient. How does this play out? People ask questions like this. Justin, how close can I get to sin without sinning? And whenever someone asks that, I know that they are on the other side saying, how close can I get to obedience without fully being obedient? Why? Those who are obedient, they don't even want to think about sinning. When it happens, it happens, and it's, and it's okay. He got grace for it. But they're not looking for opportunities to sin. They're not premeditating, hey, can I do this? Is this a sin? Or is this a sin? Or is this a sin? Right? They're not worried about, is it a sin? they more worry about, is this glorifying God? Is this righteousness? Is this his heart? Is, is my life making him smile? Is he looking at my life and saying, well done. My good and faithful servant, you're crushing it. Sin always leads to death. Sin always leads to death. He's going to go on later in this chapter and say the wages of sin is death. Which leads to righteousness. Verse 17, he said this, but thanks be to God. that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Come on now, Jesus. Let's, let's just deal with that right now. That's, I love that. He says, you once was a slave of sin have became obedient from the heart. See, and see, religious people do the right things because they know they should do it, but it's never from the heart. This is why you rarely want to hear me try to scare you into salvation. I can. I can tell you some horrific things. We did the end time series. <laughs> There's some horrific things that's going to happen. But if you're doing it because you don't want to go to hell, you're going to miss it. You should do it because I want to go to heaven. I want to be with God. I want to love God. I want to be obedient from the heart. 
That's part one. Obedience to the heart. Part two is this. I want to be obedient to the heart so that I can follow the standard of the teaching. See, some people start want to be good with God and they start saying things like, you know, I just got this special relationship with God. I don't got to come to church. I don't got to do this. I don't got to do Why? Wow, I got grace in my life. But is it part of the standard of the teaching? Is it part of the word of God? This is why everyone should be searching out scripture. Searching the scripture. God, these are the issues of my heart. What do your scriptures say? These are the things I'm pursuing in my life. What do the scriptures say? Right? And if you read the scripture and you don't understand, go find a teacher. Don't be out here interpreting things bogus. Talking about, I read the scripture, he said, God going to bless whatever I put my hands to. I might, I might go rob some people. He's going to bless me, right? Like, like, that's not how it works. That's not the standard of teaching. That's not proper gospel. So it comes from my heart to say, God, I, I want the right thing. That's the first one. The second one is that, teach me the right things. And the third is this, which you were committed. It's an everyday faithful, I'm showing up. I'm waking up saying, God, I'm ready. What you want me to do today? I'm committed. Verse 18, he said this. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Now, my practice is a practice of righteousness versus a practice of sin. Every day I check in, I get on my knees, I go, God, give me the opportunity that in my life, you are glorified and people don't see me. God, give me the opportunity that I might bless someone for your glory that they might know your love on this earth. God, give me the opportunity that I might say a word to someone who might be discouraged that their hearts might be turned to know that you are there for them. Give me the opportunity. You are looking, you're saying, God, I'm ready. Put me in, coach. Do I get to play every day? Not every day. Sometimes he put me on the bench for days to see, do you still wake up and ask for the same thing? Even though I'm not giving it to you. Are you committed. Some days I'm like, God, give me an opportunity to be a blessing to someone. And I go days without having an opportunity. But I still get up and I'm saying, I'm ready. Whenever you say, get off the bench, I'm ready to get in. I'm ready to get in. So, he says this in verse 19, and this, and this is how we're going to end this. He says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations for just as you were once presenting your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification and, and this is it God wants to sanctify you. And I'm let you know, sometimes we picture sanctification as you taking a shower and the water just drizzling on your skin. But sometimes sanctification feels like it's a fire hose just blowing you. And you're like, slow down, wait, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> I need, I like, I like that. Sometimes sanctification feels like you're losing control than getting control. Especially if you got an issue with control. 
He'll take everything out of your path to see how do you respond. If you always independent, he'll make you he'll make you dependent in the season to see. Are you willing to return more like me? And listen here. We serve a God who have created all universes. Everything. All power. And he did it all with his word. But when he decided to come in the world, he didn't come in on a horse. He like didn't come in on a chariot. He came in as a baby. Because I believe that he said, I want to know how it feels to have to depend on someone else. I want to know how it feels when you feel to be vulnerable. That if anyone wants to kill me, they can kill me. This is why I think it, it actually written into our reading in, in scripture that here when I say, I'm going to kill this baby. This is God. He could have just made him have a heart attack. But he's showing us how he works. He wakes up, Joseph, Joseph, get your family out of here. That same angel could have went to the king and killed them. But he said, Joseph, I'm giving you an opportunity to be obedient. Today, God is giving you an opportunity to be obedient. Obedient. It might seem simple, but God is saying, I'm giving you the opportunity to be part of the sanctification process. So, that's the question. God is freeing you from something. Are you getting, are you living for God? Living to God? Pursuing God in everything? Because that's the goal. That God get glory out of your life completely. Let us pray. Heavenly Father God, we ask you just thank you, God, for being such a gracious and loving God. God, we ask you thank you, God, that in seasons, God, when things are not always clear and we sometimes feel lost. Sometimes we feel angry and broken and confused on a lot of things. But God, your faithfulness and your love is always present. God, I ask you, pray, God, that you encourage us, God, to find you. To be willing to search the valleys and the mountaintops to just to be near you. Just us to realize that you have always, you had never left. So God, I just pray right now for our hearts. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters, God, that as they're getting ready to go into this world this week, that God, that they be committed to what you call them to be committed to. That in their hearts, that they want to be obedient. That God, that they're searching out the Bible. And that God, that you are literally freeing them from sin so, so that they can be delivered to righteousness. God, I pray that God, that we stop titter tapping and flirting with sinful things. God, I pray, God, that our hearts stop breaking your heart. Because of what we want to do today. God, we're sorry. I, mean, I just feel like repenting for the whole church. God, I'm, we're sorry for the times where we were selfish. 
and we did what we wanted to do, lived the life that we thought we could live, had conversations and, and flirted with things and, and did things that we should have never done. Even though, God, you have freed us from shame, God, there is no conviction in our hearts to go harder for you. God, there's, there's, yes, we failed, God, but we, and we waste time. We didn't get up and try to run harder. We sometimes walk slower. God, you gave us grace so we can go all out. Yes, God, we fail, but we get back out and we go all out. We want your heart, God. We place our hearts. David said it like this, Lord, give me a new heart. A clean heart. Because this thing right here is broken some days. It's selfish. It's negative. Sometimes it's just filled with hope. Hopefulness, God. Secular hope. For things that is not bringing us peace. Give us a new heart, God. Touch our eyes, God, to see the things that you see. Touch our ears to hear the things that you hear. Touch our mouths to speak as you speak. Touch our hands to do as you called us to do. Touch our feet to go where you called us to go. Give us strength, God, to do the work that you called us to work. For your glory and for your glory alone. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 If anyone wants to pray, um, please feel free to come up here and, and talk with me. Um, <clears throat> um, I am thinking about something, right? And um, um, I am thinking that maybe we should have a rededication service, right? So that we can, some of, whoever who wants to rededicate their self to the Lord, we can have that type of service, right? Um, I'm open. If you're interested, come talk to me. It's so that we can plan about how do we do a rededication service. But I want everyone to have the opportunity to strive and chase God in a way that your faith proclaims. All right? I love you guys, and I'll see you guys later. God bless. Amen.